on your knees till the light shone through. How long has it been since your mind felt at How long since your heart Freedom, freedom. We're in a we're in a mess. We're in a mess. Our country's in a mess. It's never been like this. Not in seventy years. Uh, disgrace is a common thing. If you want to be successful, just be sorry. That's the key to success. You know, you go out and have an illicit affair with the president or. Or uh, you uh, go out and, and run a house of prostitution or something like that, and then you get to write a book and make millions of dollars. I don't know what you would have to do in the United States today to be called a disgrace except talk about Jesus. Now, they'll get on your case about that. And uh, we don't have much religion about, uh, freedom about religion. They, they don't want you to talk about it. They'll fire you at your job. Home Depot fired a boy recently for reading his Bible at his lunch break. But then they put banners uh, promoting homosexuality all around the walls. That was all right, see. But it was all wrong for this boy to sit there on his break and read his Bible. It, it's bad, folks. You know it's bad. Troublesome times are here. The harvest is past. We're in the fall of life. The harvest is past. The summer is over. And so many people are not saved. There's more people being born every day in the world than the total membership of all the denominations and churches. We're not winning this thing. We're going backwards. You know, people say, I'd like to be a witness for the Lord if I could just find somebody to talk to. 
Well, I don't know where you'd go. I don't know where you would go that you couldn't find somebody to talk to about Jesus. You know, lady stopped this week wanting to look at a house we had for rent. And I said, do you go to church? You know, I, I said, I'm more interested in getting you in church than I am in renting this house to you. And she couldn't hardly believe that. I went to my lawyer's office this week, and the lady sitting there doing all that mumbo-jumbo they do, and, and I said, you know what? You need the Lord. I bet you're looking for a good church. She said, how'd you know? Where do you go that you don't meet a lost person? Can you tell me? They're where you work. You work right side by side with them and you're ashamed. You're ashamed. You're afraid they're going to say, that person's a Christian. That person wants to talk about the Bible all the time. You know, you, we're proud of the things we ought to be ashamed of. We'll proudly tell you how much liquor we used to could drink. How many women we run around with. We'll brag about that. And we're ashamed of what we ought to be proud of. The Lord Jesus Christ. The salvation of the world. And lost and dying souls. It's time we stood up. Let me give you a few facts. Of the 61 million people living in France, less than 1% say they're Christians. How's that? There are 6,500 languages in the world and there's no scripture translation for 4,400 of them. We, they don't even know what the Bible says. In 4,400 nations around the world. You think we're getting the job done? Only 21% of Americans attend religious services every week. In fact, the United States remains the fourth largest mission field in the world. Did you know that? You thought we was king of the hill, didn't you? But we are considered by other countries to be a mission field. There are only enough church plants to keep up with one-eighth of the U.S. population growth. Of the 16,000 people groups in the world, 6,600 groups are unreached with the gospel. While I've been up here telling you this, every minute that I've been telling you these figures, every minute 62 people die without knowing Jesus. Did you know that? And with 3 billion unreached people worldwide and current U.S. Bible college students would need to tell 1 million people of peace for everyone to hear the gospel. You say, we got preachers coming. We've not got it. Our preachers are not a drop in the bucket when it comes to having enough people to reach the lost. They can't do it. There's not enough preachers. And the preachers we have are quitting on a daily basis. Throwing in the towel. They'll come in my office and sit and cry and say, I just can't take it anymore. These numbers underline the truth of Jesus' words in Matthew 9, 37. 
Then he said to his disciples, The harvest truly is plentiful, but the laborers are few. Let me ask you a question. When are you going to get enough? When are you going to get enough of the world's possessions? When, when are you going to get enough of things of this world that you can quit and take time to seek the loss for Jesus? When are you going to be sad? How much is it going to take? of things that are not going to last. And you might leave them all behind today. How much is it going to take to where you say, the rest of my life, I'm going to live for Jesus. Don't think because you got me and Danny and Matthew and, and Lee and a few of these guys running around here. Don't think we're not scratching the surface of hurting, lonely, lost people. It's your neighbors. It's your friends. It's your sons. It's your daughters. It's your grandchildren that I'm talking about that need someone to tell them about Jesus. The harvest is plentiful. The harvest is plentiful. The trees are hanging full of fruit, hurting, lonely, lost souls. It's like Coy told about going to the cancer doctor. And, and when he mentioned Jesus, everybody there was hungry to talk about Jesus. People are full of depression and they take a pill. For depression. They call these shopping networks because they're so lonely they got nobody to talk to. Don't tell me people don't want to know about Jesus. Danny called the wrong number this week and got to talking to the woman about Jesus and she's sitting in church today. Would you have told them about Jesus? The harvest is plentiful. Your friends, your neighbors, your husbands, your wives, your children, your grandchildren. How did you get to be a Christian? Someone told you. Someone prayed for you. Somebody cared for you. And yet, we get to where we prioritize everything else. And we say, I don't understand. You don't pour oil in the motor of your car. And the engine starts knocking. Don't fuss about the car. It was your job to pour oil in the motor. But Peanut will probably tell you that most of the cars that he's worked on, that the motors blew up, had new oil in them. Where people, when they started knocking, started pouring oil and additives in them and thought, 
Boy, this will fix it. But you know, there comes a time when that fruit falls on the ground and it rots. If there's nobody there to harvest it, it's going to fall to the ground. I bet we had hundreds of bushels of pears at the promised land this year. We do every year. And probably nine out of ten pears falls to the ground and rots. And the bees are the only ones I see get any good out of them. They just lay there and rot. And I say, folks, we can make pear jam. We could make pear juice. We could slice pears and freeze them. No, no, we'd rather see them lay there and rot. You might have won your child to the Lord. You might have won your husband to the Lord. You might have won the person you work with to the Lord. You might have called the wrong number and got the right answer. It may have been the legal secretary at your lawyer's office. The harvest is plenteous. But the labor's are few. Listen. Listen. Matthew 9, 37 and 38. Then he said to his disciples, the harvest truly is plentiful, but the labors are few. Pray the Lord of the harvest to send out labors into the harvest. We sang a song this morning, How Long Has It Been? Since you knelt by your bed and prayed to the Lord up in heaven. How long since you knew that He would answer you and He would keep you the whole night through? You know, when you was a child, your, your parents probably taught you how to pray, now I lay me down to sleep. How many of you were taught that little prayer? <coughs> now I lay me down to sleep. I pray the Lord my soul to keep. Jesus said, pray for labors. What are you going to do when you have to stand and look at the, the corpse of a loved one? You know what? It's a hard funeral. It's a hard funeral. It's hard on the preacher. It's hard on the mama. It's hard on the family. It's hard on everybody. When you have to stand before a casket. And you know, according to the life they've lived, what you've seen, what you've heard. They didn't know Jesus. What do you say? There was fruit there. It's like those pears that falls to the ground and lays there and rots. When they rot, they're good for nothing. They're gone. They're wasted. And how many lives are going to pass from this world today never to go this way again? You don't have reruns.
And you have to stand there. And you say, I, I could have I could have done better. We make sure they got the right clothes. They wear them oofy do doofy breeches and gooly gagachi shirts and you know, we make sure they stay in style. Make sure they brush their teeth. Oh, you got to brush your teeth. You got to go to the dentist. You know. If they come in with a sore on them or sore throat or earache or something, what do you do? Say, well, that's what I call tough. Is that what you say? No. I got to get you to the doctor. We're so concerned about the temporary things. I'd rather a child of mine go to heaven with his teeth rotted out than to go to hell with caps on every one of them. i just tell you the truth. I'm not <laughs> condoning letting your teeth rot, but... If I had to make that choice, you know? Huh? Yeah. We worry about the wrong things. We fuss at them about the wrong. You need to get you a job. You need to get you an education. You be sure you go to work today. Don't we? We make sure of those things. But what about their heart? Is it right with God? The harvest is plentiful. Hurting people. Lonely people. You know the biggest problem we deal with at the promised land today? It used to be Pot, things like that. But it's, that's not our big problem. What would you say our big problem is? Prescription drugs. I had a lady call me this week from Ohio. She said, my son hit his, hurt his back. And she said, they put him on prescription drugs. Oxycodone. Some of those things. And she said, it's ruined his life. It's ruined his life. He'll steal. He'll lie. I can't trust him. I, I don't know what to do with him. Prescription drugs. We take them when we get down. I asked a boy this week, I said, why would you do what you're doing? He said, that's the only time in my life I feel like I'm worth anything. He said, I just feel like a worthless piece of meat till I get on the right kind of drug. And he said, there for a little while, I feel like I am somebody. The harvest is plentiful. People are lost. They cry themselves to sleep of a night. I took a boy in that they nearly beat him to death. He said they robbed him. I say he didn't pay his drug bill. You know. Thought he'd burst his eardrum. Kicked him in the ribs. Kidneys was hurt. Hurting all over. Prescription drugs. I have people tell me, I'm a drug addict, but the doctor writes a prescription. I reckon that makes it all right. I 
I don't think it does. I'm 70 years old. I've been kicked, stomped, abused, misused, and confused. I've been depressed, I've been up, and I've been down. And I can tell you before God, I don't take a pill and won't take a prescription drug or any kind of drug. I think you'd make it without it. I think Jesus is the answer. I think Jesus is the answer. I worked with a woman this week that don't have a light in her house. She don't have any furniture in her house. And she's just staying there because there is no lights and there is no furniture. And the guy said, you can stay here till I decide what to do with this piece of junk. She come out to the beach reach to get her a hot dog. She said, if I could find some paint, I'd at least paint the walls. I said, honey, I'll help you get some paint. But paint's not going to solve her problem. If I took her 50 gallon down there and she painted everything in that house, it wouldn't solve her problem. She needs Jesus. Jesus is the answer to any problem.